So um, today I'm going to be talking about, um, well I've used this as more of a moniker to talk about how to scale out uh, mobile and device applications in the cloud. And um, we've, um, we've been doing a bit of work, my community's been doing a bit of work with these, this idea of citizen sensor networks. So being able to distribute mobile applications and just collect information on anything from accelerometers and locations and then use some kind of predictive analytics on top to to um, determine some stuff. Um, but this is really about this is really about using the cloud at scale and in particular Windows as well the Microsoft Cloud. Um, so a little bit of information about me. My name is um, Richard Conway. Uh, I co-founded the uh, the Windows Azure user group and uh, the, uh, the group's been doing pretty well. We've got around about three thousand members um, who are using the cloud in lots of different ways. Um, my, my interest in the cloud is really about um, scale out, so I'm really sort of interested in how, how you can take um, lots of virtual machines and get them together to do, to do useful work. So we've been running, um, we've been running applications now which are using 2,000 virtual machine cores at one time to, to calculate problems. So I love this kind of burst elasticity type effect where you can just um, run a piece of software and just pay for it for an hour and then um, you get a set of results that's useful. Um, so um, this is this is actually quite a sort of formative introduction um, to Windows Azure. So I'm going to give you some facts. So um, I'm going to give you what it offers for mobile and device developers, and uh, we're going to just uh, spend the rest of the time doing some demos just so that I can show you how easy it is to deploy and scale any of your applications. Um, and uh, just uh, just to give you a bit of a background because I wanted to do. I wanted to go a little bit more in depth to talk about how you can scale the data here into petabytes, but I really don't think we're going to have time um, for all the material that I've got um, to go into that. But um, if um, if anybody's interested, um, my community is running a hackathon, a data centric hackathon in the cloud in London next week, so you're all welcome to come um, at uh, futurecitieshackathon.com. It's um, you know, it'll be all about you know, how to improve the lives of citizens and how to use devices um, and the sort of data that they generate um, to enhance the sound of the living. Okay, so um, device developers need to think about scaling out. Um, we've got more and more users, mobile devices are becoming ubiquitous, we've got very, very large um, amounts of smaller devices. So uh, you'll hear from uh, Paul from Microsoft later on um, regarding .NET gadgets here, but people are coming up with more and more innovative ideas of using Raspberry Pis and um, little tiny silicon chips. And all of these um, are going to need to be able to have resources, server-based resources um, that need scale. So um, just some sort of growth figures uh, quickly. Um, the, one, of the, um, one of the things that I've been using recently is Node.js. So it's very sort of high performance for, um, for, for handling web requests. And at about two and a half thousand uh, small requests per second, um, even with all the mobile devices in the world, if they were hitting those, if they were hitting a bunch of servers, it would be around about 1.2 million servers. Um, the the number of mobile devices in 2012 was one billion. Um, the number of smaller devices, internet type of things, devices, um, it was about nine billion. So you can imagine that. This is going to double by 2015, mobile device numbers, and um, by 2020 you're also going to have all of these small type of silicon devices which are going to need to talk to server applications level as well. And so that 1.2 million figure within the next 10 years is going to absolutely skyrocket. Um, the point is that we need a lot of resources to be able to service um, the requests of these devices. Okay, so. Just um, a very, very basic introduction to the cloud if, uh, if you have used it before. This is a standard slide with a nice bunch of spinning circles which is all going to trip you out seeing as you have no sleep and been fed on the ball for the last 24 hours. Um, but um, the, you know, I think, I think for developers such as yourself that are, that are really sort of working in this space, um, you need to start thinking about this now, about, about how to sort of appreciate the scale and build um, very, very large compute intensive application so that you can you can service uh, lots of user requests. And this is what the cloud is all about. Yeah. Um, so these are the three paradigms of the cloud. Um, infrastructure as a service, which is all about hosting and virtualization and 
uh, others in uh, EC2, um, made a very, very good name for itself doing this. Um, platforms and services, something that uh, the Windows Azure has become very, very good at um, producing. And then software as a service is, um, is basically what you would produce and then hand off an API to someone, and, but it would all be hosted within one of these two frameworks. Um, so the, the types of workloads that you would, you would want to use on the cloud um, are these kind of one-off workloads. So whenever you have Whenever you have activity, if that activity stops for a period of buying on prem servers, um, you're still paying for it. You've sunk the cost in um, these machines, um, but when people aren't using anything, you're still paying for it. Um, having this sort of leasing scheme where you can just have equipment when you want it in the cloud um, is perfect for this kind of model. Similarly, for this growing fast thing, if you um, if your application is has got this sort of steady increase in the number of users. You don't have to think about provisioning hardware and more resources. You can just have this sort of natural gradient of, um, of, uh, of supporting more virtual machines and um, more sort of web capability in the cloud. Um, these, I think, I think the most, the best one is this idea of um, unpredictable burst. And there are a lot of use cases of why um, this is probably the best reason. Um, if you think about you think about all of these sort of seasonal effects or, you know, market shops or these kinds of things where, where you'll have uh, users just sort of hit your application um, really, really intensely for a period of an hour because there's been a chain of effects which have just led to this. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the sort of seminal stories from Windows Azure is, uh, is a website called Pottermore, which is like a child fantasy Harry Potter world. And... Um, when they um, when they turned that on on day one, it had um, it had several hundred million users, which they weren't expecting. And lo and behold, the site didn't go down because it had this scalability inbuilt into it. So you don't have to think about the amount of resources that you want to fund. You just need to make sure that it can scale enough to uh, to serve all of your users, and that's all automatic. Okay, so. So the whole point that I wanted to get across was that only a scalable elastic computing infrastructure can solve these scalability challenges, especially for a number of devices that are following. Um, this is a picture. It's a little bit fuzzy there. It looks much better on my screen if all of you want to come out and see it. But um, uh, this is what Microsoft Data Center looks like. Um, it's, uh, I have a lot of conversations with people who, um, who don't feel that their data is secure in one of these data centers. But, um, Apart from the guy who's posing for the picture, who's probably from marketing, um, there's nobody in these data centers. They're literally, it's so secret thrill. A, um, a lorry will stack one of these containers with a whole rack of machines. Um, when, you, when you spin up computing resources in the cloud, you don't know where that virtual machine is. Nobody can pinpoint it or find out where your data is because even you don't know. Um, it's, all, it's all managed by... Um, by, uh, by a controller, by, by, uh, by, by a computing resource. So um, there's nobody, there's lots of open space within these data centers and there's nobody actually on these floors. There's just um, a man with a gun outside and a big dog. So um, there's not going to be anybody that's going to be coming into them and stealing the data with hard drives and these kind of things. So, um, but uh, they actually go on for miles. They're really sort of big warehouses, there's a lot of expansion and there's a lot of um, investment, so um, there's global coverage of all of these. So if you decide one day that you want to deploy an app in China, you can do it now in the Chinese data center or in Australia or, or different parts of Europe or the states. Okay. So um, what I want to talk about first is um, Windows is your mobile services, um, because I think um, many of you will be um, quite interested in this when I say it. Um, what it does is it, it offers a whole raft of things to mobile developers so that they don't have to worry about things like common things like authentication, uh, notifications, data, scheduling, scan, etc. So out of the box, what you want to do is you want to focus on building that mobile application and um, not worry about a lot of these things. So in the, in the examples that I'm going to show now, um, I'm going to focus on data and scale. Um, because I really want to get across the fact that you can just get, get up and running within, um, within about 15 20 minutes. Okay. 
So, um, any Visual Studio users here? Yes. There's art. I did present in Python last week, or I was told to, and it turned out that, that most of the people in the audience were actually C-sharp developers. Um, I spent weeks on this Python example, and uh, nobody appreciated it, which is a real shame. Anyway, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to the Windows Azure portal, and I've got um, I've got uh, a tab here called Mobile Services, and I'm just going to hit New, and I'm going to create a new mobile service. Um, I wrote this yesterday, and I already took up the name over the air, so this is going to be over the air too. Um, so the thing to say is, um, oh, great. Let me create a new there it is. Um, I'm going to create that in North Europe, which is Dublin. And I'm going to create a new database server. And I'm going to put in my username. Oh. It's actually quite difficult to type at this angle. Start the fly. Brilliant. Okay. And what I can do is I can generate a database um, which can actually be up to 150 gig if I want. Um, but I'm quite cheap. I'm paying for this, so I'm just going to stick with it gig. Um, it's worth saying that a lot of this is free. If you want to, if you want to start small and you want to test an application, um, you can have up to 10 of these mobile services for free. Um, and it will service a number of devices, up to 500 devices, um, and you'll have that uh, 20 meg database for free. You can pay for a big database, but um, it's actually not that expensive, like 500 or something. So, so this is creating now. And what I'm going to do while that is going on is I'm just going to show you this application that I put together. Um, and we're going to sort of fill out the blanks. So my idea is that, very simply, I'm going to take some location data from a phone application. So very, very simple. I'm just I'm sending some location data, and I'm sending a message, and I'm sending a timestamp. Um, so I'm just going to create a number of classes. First one I'm going to call position, which is just going to capture a latitude and longitude. You guys see all this, all right? Yeah. Okay. That's very safe now. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm going to also create another class which is going to be um, going to be a data structure. And um, what do I call that? I'm going to call that messages. Um, so what I'm going to show you is that we've got we're going to use a type of object relational mapper so that we don't have to interact with that 
database, we just interact with the mobile service, so it's a complete abstraction on the data side. Um, so, so every um, every data structure that we create for this mobile application will have an ID property. Um, I'm going to I'm going to create a message property, and um, I'm also going to create a longitude. Longitude, let's go into trenches, and let's create a latitude. Okay. And I also want to have a timestamp as well. There we go. Okay. So I've got my position and messages, and what I'm going to do now is now that this mobile service is ready, I'm going to click on my, oh, no. I'm going to click on here, and I'm creating a Windows Phone app, but I could also create um, a Windows 8 app, I could create um, an iOS app and an Android app, because the client SDKs are there, um, probably, so um, just so happens that I've got this dev environment installed, um, so I'm using that, but I could just as easily, if we switch to iOS, um, you'll see here that I've got exactly the same thing within Objective-C, I can just download the tool it. Okay, so one of the things that this does is it generates a special secret key, which you guys all know now, so it's not that secret, and uh, an endpoint, and I can just cut and paste this. to my app.config, uh, sorry, app.cs here, um, and now I have complete access to that mobile service. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the, I've already set this application up so that it will give the phone areas the capability to get the latitude and longitude. Um, unsurprisingly, by default, Microsoft's Latin long for this is it's uh, campus in Seattle, so it's a bit far away from where we actually are. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, is just add an additional method here to get the Latin long. Um, and this is this is all asynchronous. So so phone will go off and do this, and it will just miraculously come back. I don't need to wait. I don't need to block or any of that. Um, is anyone else freezing? Yeah, it's really coming, isn't it? So we'll get the position. Right, and I'm just going to return a new one of those position objects I've created. That, when I hit that button, I'm going to persist that data to Windows Your Mobile Services. So we'll we'll call that location. Um, just got to get location method, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a reference to a table which I'm going to create within that mobile services. And you can see that I'm using that, that object that I can't replace um, from, the, from the cloud description. And then I'm calling get table. I created that messages class before. And um, what this is going to do is it's going to, it's got a contract with that class and it's going to serialize all of that into JSON across the wire and then persist that into the mobile services table that I don't, I never have to see because it's in a, it's in a database somewhere in the cloud. So, so what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to call the insert method on that. I'm going to create a new messages object. And I've got my message, which is it's coming in from the mobile application. I've got um, the longitude, which we've got from that method, which is coming from the phone. Got the latitude. I've got the timestamp, which I'm going to use for UTC. And that should push that in, that piece of data into mobile services. So I'm just going to push out a response here just so that I know it's been done. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to go back to this mobile service now and I'm going to click on the data tab and I'm going to create a table called messages. You can see that there's there's a bunch of permissions here and uh, what I can do is I can limit access to this table, any of the tables, and uh, that application key that we sort of copied across initially into our mobile phone app, that um, I'm going to ensure that we need to use that for access. So it's going to send us along with um, with the payload over HTTP, it's going to serialize that to JSON, and miraculously it will just end up in the database. So, all right, so there's zero, zero records. Um, it will automatically build that first index property called ID. Um, so let's give this a go. Watch it break. I always find it funny. I've got um, I've got an Xcode environment on this machine, um, which seems to always die with an invalid pointer exception when I try to use the emulator. Um, but I'm using Parallels, which is a virtualization environment, with um, this phone emulator, which is sitting in a virtual hyper loop. So. But it's uh, strange that it works, but it does. I hope. Okay, well that's something to think about working. Ah, it seems to have locked out the whole machine. Let's um let's take a quick look. So, um, so what, one of the things that um, one of the things that you'll see with this mobile service is that there's this interaction with all of these services. So I can overlay things like um, uh, very, very easily just by providing a few credentials. If I register my application with Twitter, they Twitter.com, or with uh, Microsoft accounts, um, then then what I'll be able to do is have a user context on the phone um, that's a Twitter login, or you know, have a Microsoft account login, and um, 
and then just use that to access any of my data. At the same time, it provides um, it provides some. Let's see if I can kill this. Yeah, so, so at the same time it will provide um, the capability to um, to send notifications to the phone. So you can um, you can use the same toolkit um, that will sort of allow you to register channels and device tokens and these kinds of things when it's not crashing, of course. Um, and uh, and then just use these within your application. So um, let me try and do it more brutal. So I'm suspending this VM and starting again. Wow. Well, Just really simply, um, I'm going to type in a message. Uh, let's call it OTA. Um, I'll just send that message to mobile services. It's going to go off, it's going to create the table structure behind the scenes. And it'll come back in a second. Right, so it's uploaded that data to Windows Azure. If we um, if we look again, we we'll see that we've got a single record now, and it's it's built all that out for us. Okay, it's a message on the two times two timestamp, etc. So we can we can go back and we can actually physically see that um, this is sitting on a SQL Server database, and that's our over the air two DB. So if we wanted to, we could just grab that connection to the database directly so I could say I could bring up any kind of SQL manager here I can grab the name of that database only going to allow applications in the cloud to access that. So what I'm going to need to do is click on manage IP, allow IP addresses. It picks up my current address and I can save that. 
And I've just added my IP to that file, so if I try to log in again, it might take a while to proliferate. If I try to log in again in the next few minutes, um, I should see that change. Let me leave that running in the background, and we'll try it in a few minutes' time. Okay, so we've persisted that. Now, what, we, um, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to change that server script. So associated with this table, so we've got various CRUD operations that we can apply, and I've got a set of scripts. And for the time being, um, all of this is, is is written in Node.js. There's a Node.js server behind um, uh, behind uh, uh, mobile services. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to log a couple of things, and um, just so that you can see the kind of information that's coming in. So if I say, uh, sorry, inserting message, and then um, can take that item that's coming in and in the brilliant way that JavaScript does, I can just refer, refer to that message. Um, the other thing that I can do is I've got this property um, user, you can see here, and that comes with user ID. So if I hit save now, then I do exactly the same thing. So I've got two records there, and if we go to logs, you'll see that I'm getting these messages through. So there's this fine grain control is specifically designed for this sort of interaction with data. Um, my user's undefined because I haven't set up this identity. So if I have applications that use any of these authentication services, I can just put all of the OAuth details here and it will give me the user context. So the user context is also maintained on the phone itself, which means that I get a nice login prompt to it knows who I am as far as the Twitter user is concerned or a Google user. Okay. So, um, definitely reduces the friction um, for people such as myself who are not good mobile, mobile developers. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take you through um, a read operation, which uh, is, again is fairly simple, and then we'll take a look at just extending that script. So, we're going to extend our mobile phone application. And just for lack of time, what I'm going to do is just, it's going to be far easier for me to just cut and paste from my test demo. I don't think we're going to, we're going to cover all the material that I've got here. Exactly the same thing. I'm going to um, in fact let's let's skip some bits because um, I think that we're not on that time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some I'm going to put some logic in the in the server side now, and I'm going to generate an exception so that I'm not going to allow something to be inserted into that table if, um, if that particular client has already inserted a piece of data within, um, within the last five minutes. So let's just take that, add that there, and that's going to generate some kind of web exception 
and we should be able to just put that exception up on the screen. Visible, so we've updated that. What I'm going to do is just grab a snippet of code from this for brevity. Here's one I did earlier. Just talk you through that. This is my insert function on the messages table. To script, you can see it covers all of the code operations here. Insert, update, delete, read. I'll we'll stick with our insert. And what I've done is I've executed an arbitrary bit of SQL here just to check whether or not you can see. And um, I've created um, a derived um, field called time diff to check whether or not a message has been sent within five minutes. Execute that SQL using this um, MS SQL object, so I can just query this, I send in the value of the timestamp, and I check to see whether um, there's a five-minute difference. And then I can just use I can just use an HTTP response here um, if it is to just send back a message, you know, send one message every five minutes. So let's uh, let's give that a try now. Seems to persist at that time. Obviously, got something wrong. Not ideal. Um, yeah, I might not have saved it. Build up, we can build up some relatively um, simple logical constructs. Um, we don't necessarily have to use SQL, we've got a query object which will give us a more sort of JavaScript friendly in space. Um, so, what I want to do is um, I just want to show you how to get the details, then we're going to show some state out. And we'll build up We'll build up a simple list in this page and show you how easy it is to read all this stuff back. And I'm going to just write a method called um, get messages table. I'm going to return a list of messages. Use that that mobile services class that I've got. I get a reference to the messages table, and what I can do is I've got a, a whole heap of um, SQL-like functions to order by, and to group by, and to do all of these things. And I can just write a lambda, and I can group this. I can order it by timestamp here. Um, and then one, two, two, one, 
to rest ASAP. Okay. And then we're going to, um, in there, so I've already set up a list on the page so we can just use that. Um, if I can find it. Pause. Stop. Set the data context for that to await. Um, so function get messages table. Okay. And really that's as simple as it, as it needs to be to read it back. Um, we'll just run that quickly. And we'll click next here. It should generate me a list. But start. Okay, order by time. So, small bit of code to do something quite small, but um, very, very convenient. So, So this, this is really, really one of my, my key points for this for this talk is you, know, you can take what we've just done and I can just then treat this in a very, very different manner because up to now I can service a few clients, I've got a small day-to-day, -day, so you know, so I'm not really, really geared up to scale. But what I can do here is I can drag this slider to 10 um, and all of a sudden I've got this incredible amount of capacity to service just about anything that I need. I don't need to actually use that now. Um, what I can do is I can set an auto scaling option on this. So it's going to detect, it's going to look at CPU load, it's going to look at database hits. And it's worth saying that the database that we're looking at, even though in here, if this will connect now, um, Yeah, so oh, that's, oh, that's the old one. It's the, believe me, there is a database behind that, and um, it's a logical database. So it's, again, it's somewhere in the cloud. Um, Microsoft is controlling all the resiliency, so got multiple copies of this data and um, places just in case you have hardware failure on one particular node. Um, so, you know, it's, for that reason, it's sort of inherently scalable because they'll delegate the amount of compute resources in this multi-tenant environment. So the, um, the other part to this is that on our application layer, we can just say, um, you know, I want the application to be aware of the number of hits that it's getting, the number of devices that's connecting. And then we can set some really broad rules to say, um, I want it to scale between these two points. And then you'll hit your thresholds at seven, or you don't necessarily need any thresholds. But um, generally, you'll always have the capacity that you need to so that's what we'll use this here. Um, so what I want to do is just want to turn this on its head a bit and just show you the other way of doing this, which is to build out a web application. And so what I'm going to do is Rather than use mobile services, I'm going to get the, the, the phone to connect to a really simple um, REST interface that I can just return some values and do some work. So I'm going to do this in, in HP.net, but I've, all, I've done this. There's, there's very easy ways to deploy, for example, um, Django and Python applications to an Azure website, PHP applications, Node.js. Um, so it's, it's fairly sort of agnostic and um, doesn't support Ruby as yet, um, but I think that's on the cards. So there's a lot that you can do and treat this as a sort of deployment service surface. Um, so I'm going to call this mobile services web. And I'm going to create a web API. And even though we've had that sort of database abstraction, we can still reuse that within our application. 
I'm I'm going to use um, an ORM framework called MC Framework with this, but you can use Hibernate, you can use raw SQL in your application, you can use whatever you want. As you can say, not that quick. Support Java out of the box. So, um, what what is supported is um, you've. Uh, I'll just show you quickly. I'll take you through a short divergence. But um, in um, something called cloud services, um, there's Java integration with Eclipse. So, so what we're seeing, what we will see with these websites, is that Microsoft's uh, web server IIS will be hosting a virtual directory of your web application. Um, with um, with a cloud service, what it will do is it will deploy, it, uh, automatically deploy um, like a Java application server, a Glassfish, Tomcat, um, and there are toolkits that integrate really well with Eclipse, so you just, you literally write the code if you're developing JSPs or servlets, and it will just push it up to a cloud service. But it's a, it's a slightly different kind of paradigm because um, it will actually create a virtual machine for you, so it will create a Windows virtual machine and then push all of this code up. So with the websites that we're looking at, you don't have the same surface area. Um, you just, you're literally just dealing with an IIS virtual directory. Um, the, other, the other thing that you can do, um, there's quite a lot of support now on the open source side for Java. So there's, if you click onto images here, um, you can create a Linux virtual machine with um, with a whole whole bunch of stacks already. So there's LAMP stacks. Um, I think there's uh, JBoss and Tomcat and all of these different um, Java application servers, which you can just sort of deploy out the box from one of these images. So um, there's a, there's a couple of alternatives now, and the number is growing as well. Okay. So. Um, just quickly, what I'm going to do is create a new what is your website um, by default just to show you some of the things that you can do. Um, and again, these are free for up to 10. Um, you've got a whole load of um, templated websites already. If you want to deploy one of these, um, of course, Joomla, Orchard, PHP, Bulletin Board, WordPress sites, um, you can just go through this wizard and you can have up to 10 of these for free. Um, what we're going to do now is just going to create an empty website and create that in North Europe. I'm going to call that over the air too. Um, I am going to see whether I can use that database. Um, and. Uh, Um, the great thing about the great thing about these websites is that you've got a lot of uh, my past my limit. Uh, okay, so the login for the database. Um, so the great thing about these websites is that um, is that you've got a number of uh, number of deployment options. So you can deploy directly from source control. So if you've got if you've got a repository holding a site within GitHub, um, you know, it will automatically be able to detect that. So I'll create this over here. I won't create a database because I've already forgotten the password that I set five minutes ago. And I'll just show you the, the one yesterday. If I decide to to set up um, deployment from source control, you see that I have a number of options here. So if I've got my code you know, in Dropbox and Bitbucket, and um, that will allow me to connect to it. 
And the great thing is that it uses service hooks with all of these. So if I do a check-in, it will automatically pick that up and I will have employment history. Um, so maybe I can find an example quickly of this. Anyway, so, yeah, you get the general idea. Um, connect source control, deploy really quickly, um, and then you can also instant the process if you're using unit tests and these kinds of things, and, um, and write scripts so that you can have a deployment failure if, um, if any of the tests are. So we've created this over the end too. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to connect this website to it. Fastly running out of time, but just to show you the general idea, um, I can I can import a profile from Windows Azure, which I've already done, um, or I can get a list of all of the um, all of the available websites, and so I've got this over the Air2 website, which I've just created. Um, what it does is it automatically downloads this file with published settings, which has got um, information about the FTP endpoints, about the web deploy endpoints, about all of this stuff. And I should just be able to, in a few simple clicks, just publish this, and it will connect to that webs. It will connect to that website. It will package everything up. And that's it. It's, it's done. So, you know, if I wanted to if I wanted to update that, I'm not gonna have time because we've got um, six minutes left. But um, but what I wanted to actually show you was that you could you can take you can take that mobile service, which is a great abstraction, and you've got all of these um, features that can sort of get you very, very started quickly on the server side and allow you to scale. But you can do a similar thing if you want to deploy a website. Um, so, in exactly the same way, I can I can appreciate the level of scale by um, selecting one of these sites. I can decide how big I want these virtual machines that they're running on. Um, if I wanted to set up scheduled downtimes, and I can, so it's only I've got a certain amount of resource only available for a certain amount of time during the day. If I want to monitor the, uh, the CPU, I can set um, some some target CPU percentages, and if it goes over, it will scale up. If it goes um, if it goes under, then it will scale down. So you're never paying more than you need to for the number of users that you've got hitting your site. Um, but you can see that you know it's it's pretty much friction free. What I'm going to do because we've only got five minutes is just take you through the slides. And if anybody's interested, I'll take you. I'll uh, I'll send all the demo scripts so that you can try these yourself. Um, so um, this is on a sort of device by, device for device basis. So um, for up to um, up to five hundred thousand of those API calls that we saw, all of this is free, and you can have. 10 of these in any of the uh, Microsoft data centers um, without paying a single penny, 10 of these mobile services. And then as you sort of scale up for a much more richer application where you know, you, you're sort of servicing like hundreds of thousands and millions of users, it's, um, you know, the price scales up. But so uh, you can start this completely free and uh, play around with it for as long as you want. Um, so I showed you the website deployment. Um, this is, just to give you an idea, this is where these websites fit in. Um, so at the end, all we need to do is deploy our applications and data. Everything else is managed for us. You know, the web service configured, all the rest of it. Um, so we just need to focus on the task. Um, we've got a number of deployment um, mechanisms that we can use. Um, I used web deploy before, but I could have easily have just have used FTP because it automatically creates me an FTP account for that website. Um, I tried using Dropbox and GitHub and Bitbucket, it works fantastically. 
you end up with a version history as well. There's version control on the Azure website part, which means that you can roll back to a previous version if you screwed up your code. Um, then these are the frameworks that are supported. Um, Python is also supported. It's not on, on there. Very easy to deploy Python and Django apps. Um, there's now a whole deployment module within Visual Studio because they support for Python. Um, similarly, um, for, for some basic uses, it's, um, it's free as well. So you can get started, you get storage, you get um, free data transfer. But you know, it's a very, very easy sort of entry point to the You can have 10 of these, um, again, in the data center. And, you know, as you scale up and you're doing some more enterprise things, then you start paying for it. Um, so the last thing that I was going to touch on, but we um, don't have time for these demos, is just to show you that um, we can talk about scaling out in the application layer, but you know, there's also an equivalent, equivalent scalability with the data layer. And um, Windows Azure has this idea of Windows Azure storage. Each of these accounts will scale up to about 200 terabytes worth of data. Um, if you call up Microsoft, you can expand these limits. So they have soft limits, basically. But um, you can have up to six of these accounts. So um, without that single phone call to Microsoft, which sort of means that you can scale up into the petabyte range if you're storing lots of files. Um, there's, a, there's a semi-structured um, data layer that's available called Windows Azure Tables. And that will allow you to ins insert all of these values into a really sort of pseudo canonicalized format. It's all semi-structured. And what it will allow you to do is not have a fixed schema, so we can we can sort of push all of these values to it. Um, and then let's say I decide to update a record um, with my favourite sport, um, it will insert empty values into the others, so I can keep building on this in a dynamic way. And it's got it's got an index on something called row keys and partition keys, which will allow you to bring <coughs> back stuff um, very very quickly that you want to store um, together. But it's a really fantastic way of scaling up to literally billions of rows without having to worry about these scalability constraints for a relational database. Plus, um, it's all a RESTful service. So you access this data layer over HTTP. You don't necessarily have to write um, access to this on application code. You can do it directly from a mobile or a device. In fact, a lot of um, uh, internet things that have been using this because there's there's high level abstractions on top of this like storage queues which allow you to um, to use uh, messaging effectively um, on top of the storage structure. Uh, again, sorry we're not having we don't have time for that. Um, last slide. So um, Windows Zero is becoming a lot more mature now, incredibly fully featured um, and uh, supports. Caching, it's got an identity service, it's got a messaging subsystem built in, a uh, media delivery service which hosted a lot of the uh, a lot of the Olympics, it's streaming most of the content across the Atlantic. Um, it's got a CDM which is undergoing improvements at the moment, networking, so that you can you can set up virtual private networks between different parts of the cloud and um, and your own data center or whatever. Um, database which you've seen, storage account which we've touched on. And, uh, and uh, a traffic manager which will allow you to sort of locate where your users are coming from and direct them to the next data center so that we get the best sort of low latency experience. Um, and, um, and there's a Hadoop implementation of Microsoft for wrapped up called HD Insight, which is now available as a service. So if you do generate very, very large volumes of data from all of your users, you should just be able to uh, spin up a cluster within about 20 minutes. Write a very simple MapReduce function in C sharp. And then, um, and then be able to filter that data, aggregate it, and get some value from it. Okay, thank you very much. Questions?